Thank you, Paul. Our second speaker for the negative is James Shaw, Green Party candidate for Wellington Central. Uh, James has worked recently in PricewaterhouseCoopers, the Chairman's Office of PricewaterhouseCoopers, where he worked to uh, develop a strategy to face the challenge of sustainable development, and more recently has been working for another company that specialises in developing international connections to promote sustainable business practices. <coughs> so please welcome James Shaw. Gwendolyn remarked in The Importance of Being Earnest, when it becomes more than a moral duty to speak one's mind, it becomes a pleasure. And tonight is one of those occasions. <clears throat> the topic for this debate uh, is that this House has confidence in Her Majesty's Government. I and my colleagues on the negative team do not, and we believe neither should you. The debate is not whether this House has confidence in Her Majesty's loyal opposition. Although Chris and Paul have attempted to distract you from the argument, by drawing attention to the Labour Party's record in government, which was debatable, but not here. The moot is also not whether Her Majesty's Government are decent people and hard-working servants of the public interest. I believe that they are. Certainly, their representatives here are all intelligent and likeable people. In the course of this campaign, they have come to know Paul Fosterbell rather well, and he is publicly minded, well informed, generous and graceful except that his debating opponents, apparently. <laughs> the Honourable Chris Finlayson is, by all accounts, just that. Uh, recent flouting of constitutional norms aside. <laughs> <laughs> Stephen Whittington, I've only just met, except that he is well respected by his friends and his foes alike, and he is an internationally acclaimed master debater. <laughs> <laughs> little more perhaps, but he and his ministers are clearly doing their best. The question, of course, is whether this House believes that their best is enough. There are no universally shared standards by which we can hold a government. If we use the Green Party's or the Labour Party's ideals for government as a standard, then the National Party and the AAC Party can simply say that they have different ideals for government, which, as you can tell, they do. So let's start by holding them to their own standards. In 2008, John Key said many things. He was cheerful and relaxed as he campaigned on a not Labour manifesto. He told Kiwis the many policies that they liked would be kept intact. There would be no rise in GST. Working for families would not be touched. Kiwi Saver, Kiwi Bank, Kiwi Rail, etc. were safe and were superannuation entitlement to change, he would resign. He also promised tax cuts. National would be Labour, only better. Better economic managers, no less a safe pair of hands, just less tight-fisted. Now, GST has been raised to 15%, working for families is under review, KiwiSaver incentives conditions have been dramatically altered, KiwiBank remains iconic, but of course other state assets will be laid out on the butcher's block should the government be returned. The key promise that has not been broken is the one that would require him, Mr Key, to resign. This is his uh, promise on superannuation entitlement. This is unfortunate. It would do much to compensate for all his other lapses were he to disregard this one too. <laughs> in fact, superannuation entitlement has changed through failure to pay into the Cullen Fund. Now, the world is a different place than it was in 2008, and New Zealand is a different and more battered place. There is a need for vision to change with the times. <coughs> with government, and Mr Key is the preferred Prime Minister riding high in the polls, New Zealanders know this. We have given them a lot of latitude. So how is the vision changing, or how is it not? <coughs> Let me give you some examples. Starting with the superannuation entitlement and the capital gains tax that demonstrate a lack of political courage to make the hard decisions, to make the fundamental economic re uh, reforms that are necessary for New Zealand. In the absence of a cap tax on capital, particularly housing, tax and investment structure is fatally skewed, and super affordability is a policy issue on the minds of all but the government. The big ideas of credible economic thinkers, Bernard Hickey, Gareth Morgan, are not on this government's agenda, nor is the prospect of any sort of serious discussion about the need for fundamental reform as opposed to tinkering at the margins. Whether these are the right ideas, that sort of big picture visionary thinking is what we need in the face of abundant evidence <coughs> that the old tools are broken. New faces, same policy was always the wrong policy. Even before the great financial crisis, New Zealand faced fundamental issues that needed to be addressed. Yes, change is required, but the question is, 
What do you do now? This government does not seem to know what to do. It has little ideas, some prime ministerial frivolities like importing a couple of friendly Chinese pandas, uh, a national cycleway from Cape Rianga to the Bluff. It convened a jobs summit. <coughs> the big idea, of course, is catching Australia, a fossil fooled mining boom. They have not, by the way, copied the tax structure of Australia, suggesting more of an ideological than a substantial <coughs> commitment, but leave that to one side. In 2010, the Schedule 4 debate about mining in our national parks was resoundingly lost. Offshore oil, however, proceeded apace until this week. The wage gap with Australia has not been bridged, nor the tide stemmed of the numbers leaving for Australia, a measure upon which Mr. Key loudly campaigned. National's promise <coughs> a pair of, safe pair of hands has turned out to be the invisible hands of the market. The double credit downgrades, high private debt, natural disasters in Christchurch, global nervousness, these are matters largely beyond government control. But Mr. Key and co. are holding the baby with few ideas at all of what to do with it, and frankly the ideas that they do have are positively dangerous. Bertrand Russell said that the whole problem with the world is that fools and fanatics are always so certain of themselves, but wiser men so full of doubts. Her Majesty's Government do not seem to understand the precautionary principle, the fairly conservative notion that if there is even a remote doubt that something very bad might happen, that one would do everything possible to avoid or mitigate it. If there was only a 1% chance per year of a major oil spill, then over the course of a century, you could almost guarantee that there would be at least one. And yet this government, when given the chance to invest in high-tech clean-up equipment and ships, appears to have failed to do so. And they still seem so certain that there is no parallel between an oil spill caused by a freighter <coughs> running ground and an oil spill caused by a platform fire on a deep sea oil rig. They seem so certain that our barely adequate preparedness for the oil spill from the Rena, a ship carrying 1,700 tonnes of oil, has no bearing whatsoever on our preparedness for an oil spill over 400 times larger than that, which is what the Deepwater Horizon spilled into the Gulf of Mexico. So certain are they that there is no such thing as peak oil, despite the International Energy Agency announcing that the world has passed its <coughs> peak in 2006, that they have doubled the numbers of, ministry, uh, of staff in the Ministry of Economic De uh, Development Crown Minerals Unit, more Wellington bureaucrats, whilst slashing the Department of Conservation to the bone. <coughs> they talk about balancing economic growth with environmental protection. This mantra is absurd. New Zealand's economy depends entirely on our environment. Our tourism dollars <coughs> depend on pristine natural settings, notably beaches. Our agricultural dollars rely on safe natural food grown in clean soil with clean water. The ecology is the economy. Seeking to erode our environment only a little by little also erodes the foundations of our economy. If Her Majesty's Government could show me that they were capable of doubt, that they are perhaps not so certain that New Zealand's future is one of drilling for oil and lignite and other finite substances that no other, and that no other future is possible or worthy of investment, then perhaps I would have more confidence in them. What it has shown instead is cynicism, lack of substance, blinkered vision and ambitions for New Zealand that are fundamentally at odds with New Zealanders' values of ingenuity and a fair go and pride in their picturesque country. Her Majesty's Government is a government that has broken the letter of some of its promises and the spirit of others, that has used changing times as an excuse to reinvigorate an old and failed agenda and seems to have little idea what else to do, whose leader's lack of substance and character as a pleasant but politically insubstantial man is daily being exposed, that consequently wants for leadership but lacks judgment, that has eroded fundamental democratic principles and has been found wanting on its record of both economic and environmental management which has benefited the wealthy few, not the many, not the inhabitants of Megi and Close, nor those rising numbers on Struggle Street, and that therefore is lacking in its governance in all the ways that matter. They are good people, except for Murray McCulley, who's scary. <laughs> <laughs> they have muddled through, and they have done many things well. In fact, they have done some things very well. But by the standards they set for themselves when campaigning for election in 2008, and by the standards of preparing this country for the economic, social and environmental realities that we will face this century beyond this electoral term, this House can have no confidence in Her Majesty's Government.